FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is September 6, 2018. Well, millennials, we've been talking about them here at the show all week. They're a dilemma. Are they going to just take over and mature and prosper and succeed like the succeeding generations did? Or are they a bunch of losers who are hopelessly lost? I joke, but I think the the greatest profession you can get into right now if you're looking to capitalize upon millennials is tattoo removal. Uh, there seems to be an explosion of body ink in this generation. But as always, we urge you to be part of the show, be part of the debate, just write us, send us an email. If it's great, we'll read it on air or even have you on the show. Email address again is kl at kerrylutz.com. So somebody here who's really up on millennial issues. He's your founder and president of Investors Advantage Corp., John Grace. And hey, you've been around the financial arena for a long time. You've been paying close attention to the millennials First, welcome to the show. Thank you, Gary. Good to be here. So millennials, you you remark that millennials aged 25 to 34 have $42,000 in debt, and most of it, surprisingly, isn't from student loans. What is a lost generation to do? <laughs> well, we've got, uh, Lucy has some explaining to do, and we've got some work to do here, Carrie. There's no question about it. I mean, their their parents, to a large extent, particularly the ones that are the most well-to-do, understand and apply deferred uh, gratification. Uh, but unfortunately, we've taught our children, it's all about instant gratification. Everybody gets an award, no matter how you played on the team, no matter how well you did Participation trophies, yes. <laughs> Everybody gets a trophy, them. okay? So uh, we've got some uh, some learning to do here because it, it is astonishing to see that uh, by one report, I can see that 60% of millennials have already taken money out of their retirement account. Another 60% aren't contributing to a retirement account. And typically, uh, according to the U.S. Census Bureau and Dent Research, we can see that most Americans enter the workforce at 19. Of course, if you got edged in education, it might have been early 20s, but you particularly these days, the responsibility of money management falls 100% on the worker. And if it is a case that you aren't getting a job or you're not keeping a job, I mean, by one report, 30% of millennials are at home, not working, not going to school. I don't know about your household, but that certainly wouldn't have worked for me. And yet I think so many of the spouses uh, said to each other, hey, honey, don't get a job like your dad and I did. Uh, get uh, Follow your, your dreams. Yeah, you know, follow your passions. Your passion and your we'll passion. be paying the bills every step of the way. <laughs> yeah, well, passions are great as long as you have the money to pay for them. But if you don't, <laughs> Detail. you know, then really it uh, turns into something uh, quite different. So these millennials, uh, they kind of don't get it. And how do we make them understand? How do we get them to, to go on the right path here, which is follow your passions, but until you can afford your passions full time, get a job. How do we not be enablers? That's what I want to know, because what we're well, talking that's about a, is that's enablers. maybe the $40,000 question, yes. Uh, but maybe we just encourage them. They, they, they like uh, debit cards. They seem to mm -hmm. like paying with cash. They don't like checkbooks. They don't like credit cards. They do like put, uh, spending modest amounts of money, and they'll put themselves on auto pay in a heartbeat. So, you know, what I'm saying to the ones I have the ability to talk to is say, look, start at $50 a month in an account that you intend to keep intact for the next 40 years. Because as I say, you know, here's the deal. If, if just keeping it current, if you expect to uh, 
uh, reach a goal of achieving an income of $40,000. Let's say you have some other income, Social Security. Of course, you have to work to get Social Security. Pensions are dead. You know, the grandparents know something about that. Mm-hmm. The parents and, their, and the millennials don't know anything about that. But if it's just in a year that you want to have an income of $40,000 and you have to put the money in an account somewhere, assuming you're getting a 4% yield, it means today that account has to be funded with $1 million at 4% yield to get a $40,000 income. That's today. (laughs) What's that number going to be like in 20, 30, 40 years? Certainly it won't go down. It'll only go up. And again, and living is expensive. No question about it. So start with 50 bucks, start with 20 bucks, do something, but put it there and leave it there so that you can get ultimately the equivalent of what you need in 20, 30, 40 years to provide the income that you're going to require when you're not working at all. Hey, and another point is, look, there's inflation whether it's high or low, there is always inflation. So the sooner you start putting money aside, if you start saving 10 years early, then you beat 10 years of inflation. You're making that inflation work for you. Bingo. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then and, and you'll like this. I mean, it, well, you'll like it because it's interesting, but this is this came from E-Trade and their streetwise quarterly study. They're looking at uh, why people tap their 401ks accounts early. And for those age 34 or under, uh, interestingly enough, the number one reason, 23%, was for a medical emergency, 22% for education, 17% because I became unemployed, 16% to make a large purchase. This one's interesting. 13% to spend simply on myself or my family. Oh, and 7% to spend on a vacation. So as I say, (laughs) we've taught our children to embrace uh, immediate gratification. No reason to wait for anything (laughs) uh, as opposed to plan for the future because, you know, the, the, the point is, is that whether it's by design or default, like a health issue, at some point you're going to stop working. And if you put nothing in Social Security, nothing in any retirement account, now what's the the government going to do so what is the millennial millennial calamity will become americans burden that is such a great point a one significant uh, category left off of there well it's two actually one is to uh, pay for gambling debts and <laughs> the other is to actually start a business a lot of the borrowing that takes place is done to start a new business, but it doesn't get figured in there as a separate category for some reason. Um, And you could argue at least if it's to start a business, to start an, to buy an asset that is going to generate significant cash flow potentially in the future, qualified risk, business is always risk. Maybe that's not such a bad application for it, but you have to think twice. So, Let's talk solutions here. Obviously, education, but, you know, the problem is, John, there's a failing in our educational system. My son is the only high school student I ever heard of who actually had a course in basic personal finance in high school where they covered buying a house, taking out a mortgage, how do you apply for a credit card, opening up a checking account, all these little basic things. I kind of learned it. My parents showed me and I read a lot, but pretty much the millennials are are at a loss for a lot of this. They learn it. uh, They learn it uh, by the seat of their pants, if you will. Yeah, it's on the fly from each other. That's about it. Mm -hmm. So you're right. Yeah, it's a, it's a conundrum. I mean, it's one of those things that blows my mind. I, and I see as a country, we're making no efforts to change this scenario. And, and you know, we can all argue about politics, sex, religion, right? Uh, but when it comes to managing your money, it's just a conversation we don't have. And, 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 and then we throw everybody under the bus, right? If you drive a Rolls Royce, you must have been a thief. You're, <laughs> you're a crook. You got it illegally. Yeah, and if you're course. homeless, you must be an idiot. Well, <laughs> what, what about? Just keeping it the way it is and having a conversation about what do you need to do, when you need to start, like you were talking about, how do you make time your friend and use it to your advantage? And 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 and, and as I'm trying to say, 
let's spend a minute figuring out what your target is. At what point do you want to make some kind of money show up? Let's account for inflation so you can see what the exact target is. And then maybe you need to look for that which where you can put in $125, 167 a month, whatever it might be, and at 7% in 40 years, you'll have the equivalent of what you need. But if you don't have a target, you're not even on the carousel. You're in the cul-de-sac and it's dark. <laughs> and when yes. you when the light comes on in the room or in on the earth, you're going to wake up and go, oh, yes, this is just not going to be good. I don't know what they're going to do. I honestly don't. We're, we're not making much progress at all. Yeah. Good question. Well, it's, uh, you know, they've learned the wrong lessons too, millennials, because a lot of you millennials out there were kids when your parents uh, hit the Great Recession of 08, 09, and you lost yes. your home. So you're really against home ownership because you saw how your parents screwed up with it and you don't want to repeat their mistakes. A lot of it comes down, John, to fighting the last war. Now is the time you really should be because home ownership expenses cost are a lot lower than they were. And then, well, maybe the tax benefits have been taken away somewhat in the blue states, but or in the high tax states, uh, they're often not one and the same. But the point is, we learn the wrong lessons oftentimes from our experience. This is true. This is true. And, that, and that's what I find so interesting and yet, as I say, alarming because, I mean, we can see – let's look at it this way. During, it was during the Great Depression. That was a terrible time for real estate and for the stock market simultaneously in all of 24 months. But you saw people making adjustments. You saw people not consuming. You saw people beginning, those who had the means, to set those things – some some things aside. But let's understand, on a per capita basis – and to me, this is the best, the best thing I've ever seen. Seen, on a per capita basis, more Americans became millionaires during, as a result of the Great Depression, than any other time in history. So it's one thing to say, oh my goodness, the bottom fell out, so I need to go in a corner and hide. It's another thing to say, oh my goodness, the bottom fell out, where can I see opportunity that I can take advantage of that I will have no regrets for because I'm buying things or you know investing in businesses where the price is suddenly 30, 40, 50, 60 cents on the dollar as a opposed to 100 cents on the dollar because prices have just come down. But now I have the cash and the wherewithal to take advantage of this opportunity that just literally dropped out of the sky. Yeah, and the opportunities are always there, and we know it. So, yes, the question is, so education, like the uh, many in our society like to say, is always the solution. But education in and of itself is not going to solve this problem we need something more than that, don't we? We do. We need a little action taking. We need a little responsibility. I mean, whatever you feel about guns, I'm, I am inspired with uh, one that was a David Hogg, I believe, who said, speaking, she says, we're speaking now to our former generations before, before, before us, you know, the ones that came before us that you really kind of mess things up. That's not quite the word to use, but you get the point. Mm -hmm. He says, but we're going to fix it. And I like the attitude of we're, we're accepting responsibility. You're 17 years old, really? And we're going to fix this. We're not throwing anybody on the bus. We see the mistakes that have been made. And we're going to address these issues. And we're going to have some different answers. And we're not waiting for anybody to fix it. We're going to fix it. And we're going to get in office. And we're going to make sure things change the way we think they ought to. And I mean, just let's just recognize that this, these folks have a qualified point of view because you no one can imagine what it would be like to go through something like that. Mm -hmm. So to be able to have survived it and have a perspective of, about what needs to happen, whether we agree or disagree, certainly they have a qualified point of view. I respect that. Well, action is definitely the key considered action. Uh, understanding the cause, we're often our own worst enemy and that's the fact of the matter when it comes to retirement planning. When you get down the road like me, you have no one to blame but yourself. So better to take responsibility for it now, not blame your parents' generation, not blame society, because this is purely an individual decision to make. The definition of savings is deferred consumption. That's correct. Yeah, the definition, correct. definition of savings is deferred consumption. And that means well, don't take the participation trophy now for eighth place. <laughs> it means like wait for your pleasure, 
put your money away, earn a return on it. It'll give you a lot more pleasure 30 years from now to have it there with all of the income it's generated and the returns than it will be to spend it now on something frivolous like whatever you can fill in the blank but uh, the blank. you know yeah. that means uh that means like living beneath your means rather than ah, beyond your means right that is I mean, a concept. yeah let's yeah. lower the debt as opposed to spend baby spend with as much debt as possible because we know that that carousel will come to an end and to mm-hmm. your point this came from money chip but you know, some of the folks, the millennials have seen those declines and I'm sorry, those were bad, you know, experiences, but let's just recognize that if, um, in spite of the losses, 02, 08, if there had been $10,000 invested in January, 1988 in the S&P, okay, that $10,000 by itself would be worth more than $211,000 by the end of the year, 2017. But now we have a start now. And that's what I'm trying to say to the folks that I have the pleasure of talking with. Look, let's get you started and leave it there because something magical happens when you see money show up in an account that you didn't put the money in there for the account to grow in spite of your lack of contributions. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And you like, I like this free money. (laughs) I can never pick up a penny. So seeing some market gains is, is a beautiful thing in spite of those, those severe losses. Yeah. And, and there are ways to cover yourself for that, right? You don't have to be a victim of <laughs> of the market or otherwise. Diversification works wonders. You know, at the same time that the stock market was getting killed, bond prices were going up. And so while I don't always subscribe to the uh, balanced portfolio method here of you know, spreading your money around because oftentimes what happens is when you should be getting those huge gains, you're not because you're not there. And then you still get some of the losses. You get a little bit of the profit. It kind of balances out. But if there was ever a, uh, a proof of the portfolio allocation method, uh, system, it was the great recession of 08 and 09 um, if you followed it, you came out well ahead. Well, you, you're, you're spectacularly right, and and yet there are some maybe even better examples than the securities industry has uh, put before us. If we look at uh, the endowments and foundations, Yale Foundation, for example, twenty six billion dollars. I mean, the securities business has encouraged us to believe that diversification is some combination of cash, bonds, or stocks. Whether it's an ETF or a mutual fund, that's all there is: cash, bonds, or stocks. That's that's the world that we're told to just hold, buy and hold. That's probably the only thing we've taught most investors. Mm -hmm. But when we look at Yale, Kerry, this blows my mind. So this, the first thing, well, let me ask you, if you were, suppose you're on the Yale board and you're looking at your statement, June 30th, it's $26 billion as a percentage in corporate bonds. What do you imagine any number will do? Yale might hold as a percentage in corporate bonds. Uh, Maybe 25%. Yeah. See, I thought it was more than that. The last time I looked, I think it was 5%. Really? Interesting. Yeah. And so let's go a little further. It, when it comes to U.S. stocks, last time I looked, it was 4%. Hmm. Huh? Really? <laughs> 11% international. So let's see. 5 plus 4 is 9 plus 11. I think that's 20. And then, you know, uh, maybe 4% to cash. So the first thing that blows my mind, Kerry, is that they have uh, what we've been taught to hold 100%. They only hold 24%. Mm-hmm. So if we look a little further, we can see that there are eight legs under their portfolio stool. Eight <laughs> oh, and by the way, uh, they were slightly positive in 2008. They were slightly negative in 2009, but they weren't off like most uh, stock funds, 37%. The market was off 37% 20, uh, 2008 with the S&P and the Dow. So that's the kind of thing that makes me stand up and pay attention to go, geez, looks like it's, we can learn from the best and the brightest. And if we look at the other legs under the stool, in addition, to the small outlay to cash bonds and stocks, it's uh, business development corporations, it's real estate investment trusts, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, currency, it's commodities, it's uh, private equity. Now we're not 
saying this is a prescription, right? We're just looking at, wow, someone has really sat around the table and spent a lot of time figuring out how we're going to deploy the assets we have so that we can limit the losses and participate in the gains. And for me, that's a, a great testimony, if you will, to go to recognize, well, if they can figure out how to do something like this, we can all do better than what we've been doing. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great point. And I think that uh, that we can do better if we set our minds to it. First thing, got it. Got to acknowledge there's a problem or a challenge. Problem is a negative. Challenge is an opportunity for growth. And and then you have to manage it. And you go through all of these things and then you act. You educate yourself, act, and that's what your company does. John, just tell us how we find out more about you and how we connect with you on the web. Sure. The easy way to find us is why be poor. Those are three words all together, just like it sounds. Why, W-H-Y-B-E. Be poor, P O O R dot com. Uh, I do a lot of uh, writing for various publications, and I think it's part of my mission to help people understand. As I say, I charge my um, peers as responsible for only teaching investors one thing buy and hold. And I'm saying to you that that absolutely works when you're making contributions, but when you're taking withdrawals, not so much. What was yes. your friend becomes your foe. So let's right. see what we can learn where we can diversify more than we've diversified before, number one. And number two, how can we apply active management strategies, which is the best way I can explain that is, remember the movie Karate Kid, Wax On, Wax Off? Yeah. So in 08, you want it to wax off or risk off. In other words, have your account automatically behind the scenes automatically mm -hmm. move from risk assets to cash in 2008, limiting your losses to right. no more than 20% if possible, and then be fully wax on or risk on in 09 so that you get all of those gains. I believe the market in 2009 was up 26%. Well, guess what? If an account was off 20% in 08 and the gain was 26% in 09, you have more money by 12.31.9 than you did 1.108 this has been a great stock market run, but the rest of us probably took three, four years or maybe even longer mm -hmm. for the same money to get back to the same level it was in 2008. So certainly getting back to even or higher in 12 or 24 months is better than needing four years to get back to the same account value. So Absolutely. there are some things to, to take advantage of, as you say, to take action around. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you, John. Thanks so much. Hey, as always, we invite you to be part of the show. Send us an email to kl at kerrylutz.com. If it's really good, we'll read it on air or maybe even have you on air to talk about it. And don't forget, the email address is kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter handle at kerrylutz, and Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. John, Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about it and for finishing up a millennial week. It's not all uh, hopelessness for millennials, but uh, start looking for that tattoo removal artist because having tattoos all the way up to your ears is just not going to land you that uh, seven-figure job that you so richly deserve and have slaved away in community college to, to get. So, John, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks so much. Look forward to it, Kerry. Thanks so much. Look to see you next time. Bye-bye for now. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.